go. All right, come on. Here we go with another True Brew Bobcast. Here at the end of Detente Road in Youngsville, Louisiana, at Cafe Detente, I have Mr. Taylor Michael Luke, the one and only. Welcome to the Bobcast. Thanks for having me. Glad to be the first of my siblings to come. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> So we're drinking some tea instead of coffee today. Yes. It's the evening. It's the evening. Not not looking to caffeinate right. too heavily right now. So many things we can get into. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was wanting to take the first episode with you and to talk about your, uh, your games that... Uh, you spent so much time and energy and years with. And what I mean by the games is um, Taylor's been hosting games for how long? Over half my life. So since I was 12. So for 14 years. 14 years uh, you've been hosting these games. And so... Um, just to give everybody a feel of what type of games, um, first off, like where can the, y y y you film these, most of the games? I do, I do, and I have my own YouTube channel. Um, if you search Taylor Luke or Survivor Goat Island, you should be able to find me. Um, also, the Greenhouse Game, Taylor Luke. Uh, as long as you search my name, you should be able to find me. Right, so... Uh, let's kind of walk them through it and kind of go way back to a young Taylor and um, what what got you uh, so uh, intrigued and fix, fixated on these games? I guess it's it was about five different things intersecting at once. So yeah. first I really got into the cartoon Total Drama which I watched with Thomas and Emma and mom. We were really into it. It was basically Cartoon Survivor. It was for kids. And I was just really gripped by the format of someone having to leave the show every week. And I, I, I don't know what it is. I feel like it's something about the that format that really... Just, is, is it your competitive nature of baselining there? It's my competitive nature. I think it's how... I, I don't even know exactly what it is that's always interested me so much about it. I think it's it feels like a simulation of life, that you're just trying to avoid death in the game the whole time is it the process of elimination like it, you're surviving you're surviving and truly each step feels like an accomplishment or something you have to overcome and that slowly grew into me watching survivor itself which has been my favorite show since i started watching it and i think another part of that is how just in addition to like the emotional landscape of this adventure could end for anyone at any time and you got to fight for every second um that really got me invested in the different characters but also that really anybody could be successful based on the different skills that they brought to the table so i think that it was my first honestly like sporting event that i thought i could do well mm -hmm. do you know what i mean that Really, you can kind of outsmart people, even if everyone's faster and stronger. And that's so. Just Taylor kind of what choreographed me. the games at the ver from the very first game. Yes, you and and just so the audience will know, it's very similar to the Survivor you see on TV. If you're not a Survivor fan, you start off with so many people and sort of give them the ground rules there, and then also talk about the types of challenges and how you mixed it up so where not just the most athletic or the most whatever that you, so kind of describe the game a second yeah definitely so i do a bunch of different formats um i've done survivor the most 
um, which just straight up follows the show Survivor. So players are divided into teams. They do team challenges, and the team that performs the worst has to eliminate someone from the game by popular or unpopular vote. Um, and it's whittled down until there's one person left standing as the final survivor. Uh, we do Big Brother as well, which isn't a straight up vote out show. It's more of a one person wins power and puts people at risk every week. And then I've developed my own game, <clears throat> which is called The Greenhouse, which is similar to Big Brother in that different people are put at risk at different points of the game. But it's more about a bartering system and auction type gameplay. Um, so that's kind of the baseline. As far as challenges go, um, when I started as a 12 year old, um, most of it was just things that we would do at PE or that we did for like our birthday parties and stuff. Like we had these flags for flag football and we did like capture the flag or just like be the last one standing with a flag around your waist. We did a bunch of just accuracy stuff. Like we had these kind of like plastic yard darts that you could use. Um, but then you went on a puzzles and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I slowly moved on to puzzles. Those ended up being a lot of my favorites of just crafting them together. Like my friend Brody put together this really cool three by three by three cube of Tetris like pieces that you have to build into a perfect cube. Um, you and I made a few together. Mm -hmm. It was one of the few times I built anything in my life. <laughs> um, and I don't know. I liked thinking of different legs of the challenges that the teams could put their best people on. And I wanted everyone to have something that they felt like they could bring to the table. And that slowly evolved to more what I do today. And a lot of my games are more focused on trying to influence the game itself and try to add more incentives and reasons to gun for people. So I kind of try to break the ice in more social style games where people have like secret roles or different kinds of politicking that they can do to try to earn power instead of doing it physically. So that's more of where I'm starting to lean creatively. I think it's important for the non-survivor, um, if you don't understand the games, uh, tell them how do you win? Because in the end, you are voted on by the players. And so you not, don't necessarily, I won the last challenge, I win. You have to go in front of a jury of your player peers. Correct. So it comes down to the eliminated players who have been voted out of the game. They have to choose who their favorite is of the people who are still alive at the end. So, so you, you can be an ass kicking machine, but if you're a jackhole, mm -hmm. they not going to let you win. Exactly. So really like a bunch of people just think this is like reality TV, like trash TV, just try to fight everybody and win your way to the top. But that's really not what it is. What it really is, is a tact game of getting what you want, but not upsetting people as you do it. That's what it really is. And that's what I think most people don't get at a glance. So you have to lie, but you have to lie tactfully? Yeah, you just have to <laughs> lie so you don't piss someone off. You got to let people down easy. Okay. You got to let people down easy. And there lies the social skills. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, you know, I was always the guy in the back making a jambalaya or whatever and playing mr gopher but i had a first a front row seat to the emotions that go here um so we're gonna get into that yeah but but uh, let's 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 keep the parameters here going how long is a game because that's important for the audience to know good question so most of them have been one day long and by one day i mean one day yeah, so we they, start at 7.30 in the morning and we end past midnight. But lately I've been targeting like three-day weekends when people have Monday off. And I do Saturday and Sunday. So it's more of a day and a half and we finish at a more reasonable time on both days. So, so minimum 15 hours. <laughs> minimum. Most of the time we reach like 17 hours of gameplay. Yeah. So it's... Uh, it's intense. It's intense. It's a marathon. Um <clears throat> 
But so, you know, um, I've seen I've seen people come in and just get emotionally devastated because they don't understand it being a game, and they usually play a lot better their second game. Absolutely, I think that to get the full emotional growth and benefit from the game, and I really think it does offer that. I think you need to do it a couple times. Because I think, at least this is what I've gotten from my All-Stars. In fact, we just had an All-Star game <clears throat> where a bunch of them were just reflecting on their years of playing these things. And one of them in their exit interview was talking about how their first time they were like, oh, oh, well, fuck you guys, or like whatever. <laughs> like just upset that they felt singled out by the game. But the more they played, the more they understood that, you no, know, there are real tactics behind all of this, like... I know I don't mean it hatefully when I'm voting people out, so they certainly don't mean it the same way to me. And I think that because it feels so intense because it's your whole life for 24 hours, like it's easy to take it personally, but I think once that you learn how to just kind of roll with it, um, it really helps you kind of compartmentalize and like re-evaluate your initial gut emotional reactions to things. Like, really thinking about what exactly is hurting my feelings right now. And I, I, I don't know. I think there's a level of social and emotional maturity that comes with being able to take your lick in a game like this. Mm -hmm. That translates very well to the outside world, and I'm being dead serious. Right. Um, so um, what's an ideal number uh, of, of entrants to start a game? That really kind of depends on the game itself. Um, I like for there to be enough room for things to just naturally divide. Like I don't want, I, I don't think I would do le nine players or less. Like I want enough, I, I just want a bunch of personalities in the mix. So for, 18 players is a lot. 18 players is a lot, but for Survivor where I have two teams, that'll be two teams of nine. So like... 18 to 24 is where we've gone for Survivor, and I think that's around where the sweet spot is. Probably 21 is my best number for Survivor, because I like to do three teams, and that gives enough room on each side. Um, for So say if yeah. you have two teams of nine, uh, one of the teams, the, the two tribes go after each other. One team loses, and that team that lost has to vote one person off. Correct. And then they go at it again, and again, and again, and then it collapses, and you mix the tribes up again. Mm -hmm. Correct. And, um, okay, so uh, what's the most critical time? Is it the first few votes? Mm, that's a good question. I would say it's the start of the game, and that's true for any of the formats that I do. Uh, I think if you do not have a long-term plan, you're hopeless. If you do not have an idea of what the general social structure is, you're hopeless. You're not getting better than sixth place. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really about just locking down a group and just a larger game plan um, because otherwise someone else is getting organized and you're going to be taken out before you even know what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think for truly all of them, that's Survivor. You need to have a good group on your team so you know you're safe no matter when you go vote. Um, and for Big Brother and Greenhouse, it's important to just like have a core alliance that you're actively building a plan with. Um, I think a lot of people get too scared and like don't wanna like step on toes at the start, but it, you really have to just kind of set the table because the people who move first are the ones who set the table. And at, at that point, you're the one who made the rules of the game. And some of the terminologies are like a floater. So if you're just mm -hmm. floating to not get chosen out and being a Mr. Nice Girl, um, you won't ever get above sixth place. You're gonna, you're gonna, they're gonna let you come along to, for a vote. Is that kind of right? Um, I ha I have actually feel pretty passionate about the distinction between these different kinds of Let's players. Hear it. Let's so hear it. you have people staunchly on each side often. I consider a floater to be someone who's not on any side necessarily, but they just float between the sides and are kind of 
able to change their visible allegiances easily. So I find those players to be the most active and smart ones. At least that's what I mean when I say floater. So it's the people who so, can so you jump can around. Be, you can be a, that can be part of your game plan is to be a Mr. Nice Girl floater mm-hmm. to working everyone versus I'm just going to be as nice as I can to get by. Yes. That, that's a rookie kind of. That's a rookie. So like uh, if it depends what kind of floater you are, really. If you're doing it consciously, you're the best player. If you're doing it unconsciously, mm-hmm. you're the worst player. <laughs> and now, are these floaters like the good ones, like your all-stars? Do they sort of poke and get other people to do that dirty work and act like they sort of in the middle give us some examples i would say the smartest ones do i think really the ones who do it best just have each side thinking that they are together and then let them pick off one at a time just alternating between sides because that way the teams that are really against each other still have other enemies in the game but as soon as you whittle off a whole side then if there's a whole group remaining they'll get rid of the floater because now you're the outsider so as long as you keep people polarized against each other and just like maintain that balance that social balance in the house you're effectively giving yourself safety indefinitely so continue with your categories of players i think another category of player is a coaster who just kind of sticks to one side and doesn't really question it and just follows orders. Those people don't typically impress me. Um, is that a is that a potential strategy? Is like I think, is, are they drafting to come at the end? I think it is if they do it like that. I think it depends on the makeup of the people in the group. Um, I think. The people who do it smart allow other people to speak for them or to make the moves for them so that they're the one who, like, forms this big, bad, like, I'm the one to take out because I'm someone who's very impressive. So it's really, it's also an ego game of letting other people take all the credit, get all the praise, because eventually that's going to be something that gets them taken out. That transfers in the workplace. Absolutely, it does. <laughs> All of this transfers. All of this transfers. Everything survives. I love it. Okay, so what's some other type of players? Um, I mean, you have the tryhards who just like think everybody's telling them the truth. Everyone's loyal to them and they're forming a side. They're the ones who talk about who's most deserving of staying and who's playing the hardest and like who's relevant to the game. And just then there's these um, legacy champions who mm-hmm. come in, and I think that's the most frustrating to the people watching. You know, I know like Brody, for example. Mm-hmm. You, you know, he comes in, and everybody's like, "Y'all know what he's doing. He's doing it again, and y'all gonna let him do it." And he pulls it off. Why? You know, I know Brody's pretty good but why is it human nature to follow someone who seems to be know the path i think i just really think when push comes to shove people don't like stepping on toes and so whenever someone just straight up asks like hey could you let me win this challenge i'll keep you safe 90 out of 92 people (laughs) are going to go, sure, sure, just don't touch me. You can take it. I don't want it right now anyway. So Brody is the type of person who just, like, asks. And these people who aren't used to thinking strategically are in these game scenarios. Like, if this is your first time hearing about Survivor... And you just gave Brody your gun. And you just gave Brody the gun and he's going to shoot you in the head... (laughs) Two hours from now. <laughs> so I think it's just having that oh, I love it. just willingness to compete and ask and just be bold. A lot of people will just kind of yield to you, which has always been wild to me. But that's just because I, I've spent hours with every single one of these games. So like, of course, I'm analyzing like the social shape and structure of all these games. But I think 
I, I just think it's really just short-term thinking and like failing to visualize. Like I, I like to think of the games in shapes of like w this side is side A, this side is side B. If I put people on each side, which one's bigger? Like as simple as that. And then just trying to whittle down the power and like how I would feel if one side's completely successful or not. Like, am I safe if this side wins out completely? And if not, I need to start chipping them off. Um, I don't know. So when you plan the game, do you, are you trying to have a balanced game? Planning? Yes. Oh, absolutely. I think, um, especially lately, I've been really focusing on um, challenges that anybody could win. Um, in fact, I want it to be almost random outcomes, honestly, um, because I think that just makes it more interesting. If there's people who, if the, if every challenge is run across, run a mile right now, yeah, it's a it's skill be, game. It's a, a skill game, and that's not as fun to me. I, I want everyone to have access to power, and I also want it to be unpredictable. Mm -hmm. So that's the main way I try to balance it. I also try to make sure no one knows more than three people um, <clears throat> so that everybody has to actively make new relationships to do well. I try to consider the different types of personalities. I try not to have just one dominant Brody style personality I want to have multiple so at the very least they go after each other or if not they're that much more visible because it's multiple of them you know what I mean so I try to fill in the blanks for people and again with a lot of my political style challenges I try to give people incentive to go after each other because I think a lot of people are just scared to make that first move so um all of Taylor's Birthday and Christmas presents uh, requests were cameras. Matter of fact, the camera that we're filming right now is one of Taylor's Survivor cameras. Mm -hmm. And uh, you became quite the uh, the uh, video maker and um, um, the editor is the word I was thinking. Mm -hmm. And so he has camera crews coming in and they just try to capture as much content as they can to tell the story of the game so a typical say 14 person game you know how much film do you have and how many hours of editing is typical a lot like kind of an embarrassing amount i would say a hundred hours uh, of con of, 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 editing. Con of edit editing easily 100 hours 100 hours per game of like time in final cut pro putting That's it together Three weeks if you go and clock yeah, in. Yeah, three work weeks if I'm clocking in. And how long does it take you to do that? Um, oh, I know 100 hours. Yeah, 100 but I mean, hours. But, but like uh, a month? Oh, like, um, it really kind of depends. I mean, while I was a student, it was easy to kind of time it to where, like, oh, I'm about to have winter break, so I have a month to do this, and this is what I want to do. Is that fun to you? Like, you get to see the game? Absolutely. It's like like people who like to do jigsaw puzzles or something. Mm -hmm. Like, I just like putting these things in order. It feels like a puzzle. It's very soothing to me. I, it's fun because I just like the strategy of these games, so I'm watching it unfold, and I'm really I'm trying to figure out the exact order that these people made different discoveries or are able to have this conversation mm -hmm. um, and making sure I put the right information beforehand so that the audience is following along with what the players know. Um, and it's just very relaxing and it helps that it's all my friends on the show. So I'm also just watching them interact and like say something crazy. And your players, they range age. Tell us a mm -hmm. little bit about your players. How many players total have played in your game? Over 300. Over 300. Give us age and ranges. Um, For most of them, like especially like college and pre-college it was mostly my peers but since then like um just as my circle has gotten more diverse especially by age the players have done that too um so i pull people from like the college classes i've been in different theater groups that i've been in um friends of a friend people play and then they have five people who they invite over for the next one mm -hmm. so it's become a real network of anybody and everybody and that's some of my favorite parts of it is just seeing these random people from every corner of my life meet up like someone from my middle school theater meeting someone i took con, con law with at ut <laughs> it's crazy to me why are you talking i know i know it is it's that's always fun and they come in fired up 
They mm-hmm. are ready for the long haul. Um, so, so through the editing, and you have talk a little bit about the diary room. Oh, sure. So for Big Brother specifically, we have a camera set up just like this one where the player presses record and then tells the camera their thoughts. Um, And that's always very fun. Um, For the other ones, it's more of a pull a camera person aside and talk around the corner to the camera. But it's just funny to see people put on their television persona. I think it always surprises me how quickly people get in and how immersive it really is for everyone. But everyone's trying to just throw one-liners and be kind of mean about it. Trying to make good TV. Just trying to make good TV, and it's just... Which is hilarious. It's just interesting that that's the instinct. You know, like, no one's necessarily prompting you (laughs) to be shady. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I know when you watch the, uh, you do a great job of editing and sort of uh, illustrating how they're thinking and talking about their strategy, but over here on another camera, it's failing miserably. Oh, absolutely. And so how, how much, how much, how, you know, how, how much is it where people are accurate versus totally wrong? That's a good question. They have to be wrong more than right. They're definitely wrong more than right. And it's really just tunnel vision, if I'm honest. It's a bunch of people who just like get set in a plan and set in an idea. And they're not listening to the literal word for word sentence that's being said to them. Because they're so focused on communicating to someone that they lose track of taking in information. Are they not listening? They're ready to say something versus listening? Absol- absolutely. That's, That's the, the deal. Ma- that- That's the... Everybody makes that mistake. Every- mm-hmm. I made that mistake when I played. Mm-hmm. Wow, so much of life to be learned here. It really is. So like, I, I, And it like is emotional and it is difficult and it takes a second to kind of break into this. But it really is just a vacuum simulation of difficult conversations, higher level thinking, reading a room with stakes that ultimately, ultimately doesn't mean anything, you know? (laughs) But in the 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 fog of war. In the fog of war, it feels real. (laughs) But that only enhances the practice experience to me. So like, I don't, that's how I justify it. (laughs) <laughs> but, uh, well, I but mean, people you know, really, if you have yeah. 18 people, 17 are losers. Exactly. You have one, so everybody's butts hurt except mm-hmm. for one. Except for one. That Which makes it better. Who got grilled at the end. Who got grilled. There's so, no winners. There's no winners, but <laughs> that's the point. Like, the game is supposed to be frustrating. It's built to frustrate everybody. So once you go in knowing that, I feel like you get so much more out of it. It makes you feel alive. It makes you feel alive because it feels like life or death. Uh, Let's get back into strategy. So when you start off, you want at least how many ride or die till the ends that you have to... I mean, because isn't most of the winners have this strong blood alliance... I would say so. I would say it's more, it's important to have about two people who would do anything for you. And then outside of that, it's just forming as strong relationships as possible. Um, I think what's really interesting is how careful people try to be with their words. Like they think it's different to say, oh, I want to go to the end with you. than I want to go to the final two with you. In one of them, they will say, I feel justified in voting you off. Because we the, just said the end. Because we that just said be... the end. But mm, I told antics. you too, so it's a bigger deal. So it becomes pretty semantic-y too. So I think also just deciding who you use what words with, um, who you make a pinky promise with. It's just interesting, mm-hmm. the rules people put on themselves. Mm-hmm. So it's all those things at once. You know, I tell you, I remember the early games when y'all were doing water fights and swims mm-hmm. and noodle wars and 
tug of wars. I mean, you had some. What what's some of the funnest games you remember when you were in your younger games? I doing capture the flag has always been a favorite of everybody's, though it kind of takes too long for me to want to do now. Um, like I remember one that people jumped into like a canoe and like canoed across the pond to avoid getting pulled. Or just that kind of thing. Like, it just feels mm-hmm. like you're in the jungle right now. Right, right. Um, I've always liked... People love what I call the shady game, which is I just ask you questions about the group, like, who's the funniest? And if you answer in the majority, you get to give someone else a strike. Mm-hmm. So you're answering your opinions about people, but also openly targeting people in the challenge. Mm-hmm. So just a bunch is thrown on the table it tends to be funny, funny questions, but it also kind of informs the game itself. Like, who do you think is going to win this whole shebang? Who's winning the season? Mm-hmm. And honestly, I believe they get it right like a third of the time. Really? So everyone agrees on who's going to win, but they keep they going. keep letting it happen. It's crazy to me. Um, so that, I love... The team challenges, I always start with a big relay at the start of every Survivor season, at least. Get them wet, get, get them sweating. Wet, get them sweating. Like, as bi- the bigger the challenge, the better, just for everyone to go, oh my God. Right, right. You know, like, I think the faster I could just kind of, like, shake them up, the more into it they'll be, even if my next challenge is rock, paper, scissors. Right. You know what I mean? Like, just get people in the mindset quick. So... Those are my different challenge tactics. <laughs> oh no, it gets real fast. Um, so, um, what what are some of the 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 um, the feedback you get? I mean, you start at twelve. Some of these, some of them drift away. Some hang around. Uh, some come back and forth, and always always a friend of the house and the games. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's some of the feedback you get from from some of your old friends as far as for what did the game do for them? Um, I actually did a whole video for my 10 year anniversary where people sent in videos just talking about their favorite moments from playing and also just what they learned about themselves and what they felt about it. And I think a lot of people get a bunch of self confidence from it, um, just in feeling that they can sway people or like can overcome different challenges that they didn't expect, even if they didn't necessarily win, like they made it much farther than they thought they could, or they um, came back after being voted out first and won the second time. Can you think of any, any of those uh, major, major improvements? people? Absolutely. Like a good, like eight of our winners have also been first boots before. Really? Yes, really. So I always just try to say like, hey, y'all, I'm so sorry if you're the first to go, but sometimes it's just a bad draw. So just, uh, I kind of lost track of the question. but uh, It's it's like, like, I think of a Riley Haydale. Mm -hmm. And so he got like first boot, maybe twice. Twice. And then second or third boot. He was just being picked on. He got a little older. But he was determined. Mm-hmm. And he came back and won. And he came back and won a game. So, you know, had he given up the first or second try, you know, uh, it, it might be a different story. Yeah, it, might, it would have been a, a more negative memory. But, again, I think it's learning to compartmentalizing, learning to car- compartmentalize exactly what about this game stings and... What does it really, what does it really at the end of the day mean? Mm-hmm. You know, like I know when I'm playing a game, this is what I'm thinking. So should I be offended by what these other people are doing to me? Right. And what does competition mean? What is it about competition that makes me take it personally? And if it isn't actually that way, what else am I taking personally that I shouldn't? What else am I reading too much into? What else am I making myself the main character of the game, even though I'm not actually the winner of this situation? Right. You know what I mean? So oh, I yeah. think it's a, I th- it really is an exercise of today is not my day, mm-hmm. you know? And yeah, I think that's I, the I, gist I, of what people take from it. 
I agree, and I have a lot of um, kids come in for the first time, and they like, Mr. Bob, what um, what advice do you give me? And I always say, learn how to say someone else's name, like, hey, Taylor, can we talk? Just say mm-hmm. that. Absolutely. Just say, hey, Betty, can we talk? Because instead of going just try to talk, which you kind of want to do all that also, but basically get used to saying, can we come over here and have a quick conversation? Mm-hmm. You're making a connection, you're saying their name, and you start to, hey, what you think? What's going on? What are you thinking these days, you know, right now? And so I think the ones who just sort of float and don't have a social game don't fare out in the end. Yeah, absolutely. I think if I had to give one piece of advice, it is to always keep track of how productive your conversation is at any given moment. Like if you find that you're just retelling things or recapping things that are happening, nobody's getting helped by that. And right. like, in fact, a lot of people just try to recap or bring up things that already happened as a way to just distract people from realizing right. they're the target right now. Right. So I think they want substance. They, so try to get substance out of your conversations because otherwise you can promise they're having substantive conversations elsewhere. Right. So look, take a survey of how often you're repeating yourself, how often you're actually making headway, how often you're actually looking ahead and just really make sure that because you don't, it, it is a long game, but you ultimately don't have a lot of time round to round. So or you have a limited amount of time round to round. So make the most of the conversations you actually get to have and maximize the number of conversations you're having, which it gets exhausting, but... How much you're value is it when you say, hey, Taylor, they're really talking about voting you out, like warning people. Does that... That can, that can help and hurt, right? It can help and hurt. I think the game is built to incentivize shocking people. Because in Survivor, there are these powers you can have that nullify the votes against you. So if you give someone a heads up that they could be going home, they could completely turn everything on its head and ruin the whole thing. Panic and blow the room up on the way. And blow the room up. Uh, Same for Green. We've seen that. And we've seen that plenty of times. (laughs) Or like if you tell someone too early that they're going home, they now know and they could go pick off votes to turn it back around on you. Or for the greenhouse, if you get voted out, any money that you're holding just disappears. So if you tell someone they're going home, at the very least, they could hand off their money to their best friend. And then that person has twice as much money to come after you later. So so that's it's, it's a difficult game to be honest with people. It's, mm. it's built to not be honest with people, unfortunately. Mm. So it's just about finding that that's the whole game. So how do you take these people out in a way that's effective, but also doesn't sting? Right. Oh, it's brutal. So I've noticed a lot of repeat players Mm -hmm. that play different games. Mm -hmm. So in your, um, um, you checking out and, and you doing all the editing and whatnot, your observation, uh, do people bring in alter egos or do people keep the same personality but just shift their what they saying and not saying? Do they go from I'm going to be aggressive to I'm going to be Mr. Nice Guy because it didn't work the first time? How much tweaking of their game do you see? I see a good bit of it. I would say it's mainly people getting calmer because after you do it once, you kind of realize like, oh, I know how intense it feels in the moment and how much I'm panicking in the moment. I didn't die the first time. But you know what it feels like tomorrow, which is, oh, that was fun. It is now over and I'm Facebook friends with all of these people. You know what I mean? Right. So like I can just keep, I can keep a more chill head. And also I've played this three times. So I'm pretty sure this isn't going to be my last time either. You know? So like this, I don't like by making it less make or break, you can kind of make calm decisions mm. in a way that makes you more effective too. Again, transferable to life. Absolutely. Right. So like 
And also because it feels so intense in the moment, you can recognize those same exact feelings back out in the wild. Or at least I know I have. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, I know this kind of anxiety. (laughs) You build a little emotional intelligence. Uh, Emotional intelligence and emotional, I don't know. um, Maturity. Maturity maturity. and like flexibility. Mm -hmm. Um, So what's your favorite? I mean, I know you, you have to have good TV. Yeah. So I'm sure you you engineer the um, dr- some drama traps. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, give us some examples. Like, for example, I'm trying to think. Um, like, I like, know for your greenhouse game, you have this Venus fly trap. Deal. Yeah, that's where I was going. Okay, good. Um, so for <laughs> this, so what? <laughs> So in the greenhouse, one thing that you can do is uh, for the most expensive item in the shop, you could buy different powers. But once per season, you could spend about 10, do- 10 game dollars on the Venus flytrap. And if you get that, everything's canceled and just one person has a gun mm-hmm. and can take out anybody in the game. So typically, Right then and there. Right then and there, no questions asked, goodbye. A car bomb. A car bomb. So it, so a lot of the game before the Venus flytrap is taking tabs on how much money everyone has, like trying to get people to spend money so mm-hmm. they, they don't have more than you. And ultimately, as soon as one person bids on it, everyone else is freaking out and trying to make sure like, do I feel good? Do I not feel good? If I don't feel good, I need to throw my money at someone else mm-hmm. to beat this person at right. their bid. Um which all results in, in sudden death elimination mm-hmm. in the most aggressive way possible. So like that just in itself builds a lot of tension in the game or like for a greenhouse all stars, mm. I revealed <laughs> that for the first round, we would actually have an additional fly trap that was much cheaper <laughs> that would basically have to get purchased in the first round just as everyone was getting settled in. Mm -hmm. So again, it's placing all the top people in a room and then putting a bomb in the middle for them to like figure out. So you design all of these games in your head. That's just the way Taylor's brain works. Yeah, it it is like just often when I'm just truly anything just kind of piques my interest of like, Oh, I can turn this into some kind of game mechanic Mm -hmm. or challenge. Um, like today I was just thinking about like the little scale you have in the coffee shop. And I Mm -hmm. thought, Oh, maybe one day I could do like a, everyone gets a bag and you have to fill it up with something and get the closest to five pounds. Right. Like just some object I have, I can make a game out of it. Right. Or like some show I'm watching that I'm really into. I can make the theme of a season right and just like different elements of like i I did it once for the show dance moms right of just like different elements or catchphrases people had and i like would build a challenge or some kind of secret power around it like i had a challenge like abby lee miller says save your tears for your pillowcase so i had (laughs) like a like a golden tear game mechanic for like saving things up for later. Right. Or like on that show, they have a, a, the dance mom's pyramid where she ranks the dancers from best to worst each week. So I made that into, okay, this week we're doing a dance mom's pyramid. You have to rank everybody based on how much you trust them. And the people at the top win something. So just like, that's just some examples of just like, I got to tell you that Taylor, as your dad, I was like, I was, you know, I was just supporting the whole thing and loving it. But I was like, okay, Taylor just took these people for 17 hours. It's 2 o'clock in the morning, and they're voting this thing. There's no way he's going to get one person to ever come back and do that again. Like, I I would think, you know, this is brutal. Why would anybody? And they are, they fight to come back fight for zero dollars yeah there's no like, price and i think they eat good and have fun they eat good and have fun so that's part of it um and i think that the, it's a few things so first it's on the front end so I, I only ask people if i think they are in a place to handle it 
Like, if I think it, it, like, I try to think, like, would this be a good experience for this person if they are first boot or the winner? And they if can't I can't be emotionally fragile, they can't be emotionally fragile. And like, I, I try to send everyone video links, like, hey, look, watch if you want, like, know what you're signing up for. Um, but I am inviting you because I think you can. Right. Um, and then also, I, I just really think it's the outside the game parts of it that really get people more into it. Um, like having a whole camera crew and that kind of thing of people who you can trust who aren't in the game, who are like interviewing you and like know what you think about a situation. Because where else in life do you get this? You Nowhere. Nowhere. And nowhere. Nobody's following you around. A camera crew's not following anyone around. Ever. Ever. So... So it's all of those things. I think it's the novelty of it. I think, I think people just love competition. I really do. Even though it's brutal, I think that's part of what people like. Like I can last seventeen hours outside and be exhausted, but make it, but push myself that much further. Right. You know, I think people like the challenge of it, yeah. or for whatever reason they feel accomplished at the end. And especially if you are lasting that, it, it, it's twofold. So if you're lasting that long, you're making friends that you're overcoming this game with. You're part so, of something. So you're part of something. And if you're out early, then we have a bunch of audience members and camera crew who like adopt you mm -hmm. and like tell you how robbed you were and how wrong everyone was to vote you out. Lying again. Well, everyone's lying again. <laughs> um, but now you're watching the game and seeing more about what was actually happening so you feel like you're part of the production, you know? So I feel like no matter what, like, you're... you're you went, you're having a good day. You're having a good day. You're making a friend, you know? And I, I, I don't know. I, I just think that it's such a unique experience. And even though it's 17 hours, it feels like you know these people for a month. I know. So it also fast tracks relationships and friendships, I find. Uh, heck, I think you had... Uh... One or two get married from the show. I've had two. Marriages. Two people met and got married uh, from the show. From the show. That's big. Mm -hmm. Like, that really is. That's awesome. Uh, a bunch of people dated, I believe. Yeah, we had a few people date. Um, but yeah. more so a lot of friendships. More so, more so, mostly friendships. Mostly friendships. But at least two, at least two weddings where they like, can at least kind of say they met through right. me in the game. Right. <laughs> oh, that's good. I tell you, the vibe is awesome. I mean, it's really an upbeat day. Um, you know, everybody is uh, it's brutal, but everybody's eating popsicles and jumping in the pool of the pond and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, chatting it up on the side. And there's, there's, there's probably more people here not playing the game, yeah. the, spectating, than, than playing, playing the game. Mm -hmm. which I think takes some of that intensity out of it um, in a way that helps the experience. And um... sorry, I lost track again. No, we were just talking about the overall vibe of the day, you know, just, mm -hmm. just the, the, Ooh, what yes. makes it special. I think another thing that we do well is we lean into the production value of it in that it's very apparent the whole time that you're playing survivor in a backyard. Right. You know, so, like, we try to incorporate dumb themes, like we'll do a Dance Moms theme. Right. So I think that also just kind of, like, being tongue-in-cheek about it, like, makes it all feel silly. Oh, the too. bandanas and, and, the, like and, the, the, and, and the, the silly props tokens and the, and the props. And we'll and blow up a big alien or whatever. And got to have space. a fire to Got to have a fire, like, and we're, t we're snuffing your tiki torch <laughs> with, like, a stick that we... Right. stapled a bowl to a tie we love a tie uh, tying something yeah yeah so just like it's all like it it's, feels intense but like you can remind yourself silly, right it this is pretty dumb also yeah i'm on a sawhorse with a tennis ball right. in a stocking mm -hmm. yeah. knocking over blocks right like i lost a challenge so i have to wear a wig for an hour right right now you right. know so i don't know <laughs> No, it, listen, you, your creativity and uh, it's made it fun. And it's a very unique experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so uh, you started in grade school. Mm -hmm. 
and you just graduated law school and passed the bar. <laughs> and passed the bar. And you're still having the games. Mm -hmm. And so how's that's a big change right there. How's how's it evolved? How has it evolved? I think really every game has always been different just because it's the experience of the group of people who you put in the game. I think, especially growing up, it was very much a time capsule of my closest friends at a given time. Like the people who I was in a musical with, like mm -hmm. they were a quarter of the cast mm -hmm. or that kind of thing. But now I also think it's where I am creatively and it's more of a time capsule of just kind of the references I want to make in any given game, especially in editing too. And like what I try to do mm -hmm. to make the episodes funny or uh, if it feels more just like a documentary, like live feed style, like what kind of tone am I going for in the game? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. I think that especially with time, I'm able to sell it more as like a, hey, this is a proven community builder. Mm -hmm. Like I know it's intimidating and it feels like a lot, but I have this whole backlog of examples right. you could go look at. Like right. this is legit. Right. And if you think this looks fun, it's going to be the same. Right. So I, I think it's all of those things. So I think it's kind of taken on a life of its own, especially like I have people who apply to play now. Right. Like for my next one, I have eight people flying in nice. from outside the state. So I, I think just... Still, like, well, can, they can afford it now because they're lawyers because, and doctors. Yeah, because I'm 26 <laughs> now. Um, Is it still therapeutic for you? You like You like it as... Is it a hobby or is it, what would you That's categorize? a good question. I, I, I guess it's a hobby. Like I, it is therapeutic for me. Like it's just relaxing to me to make the episodes and do the videos and plan out the game and think of what's something cool I could do to make everybody shocked or like mm -hmm. something. And I just like seeing the reaction. I like rewatching the reaction <laughs> and it is therapeutic to me. I, if I ever got the chance to like turn it into a business model, I would love to. I was going to um, ask you that because, you know, there's a lot of, you know, general managers and CEOs out there who need team building. And let me tell you, you do this for a day with your tight circle of managers and salespeople and creative minds you walk out a different person. I mean, I've been to workshops and heard rah-rah people talking crap. This right here, I think, has so much value. If you did this in Austin, I think I think it would be awesome. I really would love to, and it is on the table for me. Just, it's always been, like, I think that's another just motto I have in making this is mm -hmm. I care the most about this. Okay. Period. That's, that's the healthiest way to think about it. You know, it. like, I need to expect that people are going to drop out of the game the day before. I need to expect that people aren't going to know what to do strategically. I need to expect, that, like, just all these different things. It took you a minute to get It took there. me a minute to get there. But again, that's another lesson that I've just taken from this. Mm -hmm. And so I think that as a result, like... As far as like a getting people to buy into it or like make it into a business, as interested I am as I am in that, it is a plan B for me. Like that's why I went to law school, uh, <laughs> you know. So it, it's a goal, but like I'm very comfortable with it as a hobby. That just like I bring people into my creativity. So it's. it's I'm telling all you, those man. Things. If you do it, even on a small scale, even if you have two teams of five. Yeah. And figure out a way to, you know, the process of elimination thing is. is it, it makes is, it difficult. And like, yeah, so I don't as know far if as like you a, can reverse that some kind of way. Yeah, it would have to be more like team buildy or like if, or maybe like a mole type of game where you're trying to like figure something out, like secret role type of thing, or just focus on the challenges themselves. Or well, maybe a um, series of challenges, like yeah, escape rooms, like escape you talk room type of thing. So that kind of thing. So I think if I ever did make a business or like a let me go do something for these corporate people. I think it would look more like that, but I would also offer the elimination package mm -hmm. uh, for people who opted into it. And like, I would give like a, 
Like, mm-hmm. hey, y'all, this is the PowerPoint. Like, mm-hmm. just be cool, and this will be fun. Just be cool. <laughs> well, and, you know, you can probably follow up a week later to have, um, mm-hmm. you know, just just to come back and have a debrief. Yeah. And maybe show some footage <laughs> and just say, okay, uh, Howard was talking to Mary here. What? Mm-hmm. As a group, how, what are we going to learn from yes. this? You know, you can help make what, it hilarious. Yeah. What active listening techniques were could have might have been missing here? Right. Or just like how something would, like that. Would you want to do over here and just yeah, like, like something like that? Because <laughs> it is fun. It is like that's something not to be lost. This is it's funny. The games oh, yeah. are very hilarious to watch. So you have to laugh at yourself. Yes. Yes. Which I think is. Again, like a huge transferable, a huge transferable skill, and like that's what it all is. Like, not taking it personally, like laughing at yourself, laughing about the situation, realizing people aren't out to get you in a situation where it is like targeting people. Like it, it, it isn't about like. But don't you think once you <laughs> realize that, mm-hmm. once you realize that, uh. You know, your ego's kind of aside, mm-hmm. your butt's not hurt, you relaxed. I think that's when creativity is born because Absolutely. that's when you start coming up with the most creativity. So maybe from a corporate standpoint is them learning how the lesson of getting rid of that junk that doesn't matter to open the field up Mm -hmm. for creativity absolutely it's just getting people to sign up for that you know Um, well you gotta you gotta set set it up for that oh yeah no absolutely and i and i think i could and i have uh, again a backlog of proof or just like of examples not proof but um i because i really think because that's what i enjoy the most is the feeling of survival and that's where I think the real lesson of the game comes. But it's a tough lesson to learn, at least for most people, at right. least for me. Right. But it's when I learn and I just feel like I, I feel like I do take things less seriously. And I do take more of a moment to step back and think, am I the best person for the role I'm putting myself in? Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. And, and I just, and I'm a firm believer in it. I really am. Well, you should be. It's a great product. Uh, tell everybody how to watch the games. That's, that's yeah, the- so um, if you find me on Instagram, 16TLuke, or on Twitter, TaylorLuke919, I post it all the time. Um, and again, if you just search my name, Taylor Luke, on YouTube, you should be able to find me. Um, but yeah. <laughs> so, so what's your... Um, you gave some good advice, uh, but I'll ask it again. What is, what's your biggest advice for people who... Have uh, who who's fixing to come in, never played the game, and want to play the game, or or if people are interested in in the transferable value, what would you say? I would say just be willing to put yourself out there, because I think the one of the most attractive things in an ally is someone who actively wants to play the game and wants to be there. So don't be afraid to show that you care about being there. Be vulnerable. Be vulnerable. And it might not work, but at the end of the day, you're in a backyard. Right. You know? So why not be vulnerable? It doesn't matter. Right. In a good way, you know? So, uh, yeah, just go for it. Go balls to the walls. (laughs) Uh, Hey, listen, I loved it. I love doing it with you and 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 my other two kids. They were very much involved, but Taylor was the engineer behind it and um, still is. And um, hey, you know what? Um, it's a very unique thing you're doing. Uh, I'm glad. I hope you never outgrow it. I think it's. I hope you go into business with it. I do. I hope I do. And so, um, um, anyway, that would be. That would be really cool. All right. Any final thoughts or anything? Mm, Not really. Comment if you want to play. I'm always looking for people. (laughs) Um, And also, you don't have to play if you don't want to. You could come film. You could come check it out. Just as fun. How many games a year you try to have? 
That's a good question. It's harder to say now that I'm in the workforce. Um, so thank I, God. By thank God, by the way. <laughs> um, I shoot for three day weekends just because I feel like it's easier to get people to commit, especially so like a Labor Day, like something. a Labor Day. So we're looking at two or three times a year right now, though. It's fluctuating right now. I guess this is my answer. And you hope to have a game in Austin. I do. I do. That's that's the goal. Okay, well, good. Well, uh, my firstborn, Taylor Michael Luke, uh, guest today, talking about his very unique games. Check them out. It's definitely something different. It is since you was 12, so 14 years. 14 years. Crazy. Wow, how funny time slips away. But it's been a lot of fun, a lot of great, memorable noises uh at the house and around the pond still happening i hope it goes on for a long time but uh i love you brother thank you love for you coming too. of course and uh, another edition of true brew bobcast and we'll check y'all next time cool